I have been gendered correctly by people who have been nasty and disgusting to me. And I've been misgendered by people who have treated me with nothing but kindness. Mm -hmm. The community, I feel like way too much encourages people to assume completely that by pronouncing you correctly, this is the this is the entire representation of their feelings about you. Mm. It encourages people to abandon their power to choose their response. Hello and welcome to the Fifty Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex, and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to make a contribution, you can become a patron on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a queer woman and my pronouns are she and they. In this episode, I have a conversation with Lola Phoenix, a writer, podcaster, and author of the recently published book, The Anxious Person's Guide to Non-Monogamy. Lola's pronouns are they and them, and they are agender, non-binary, and queer. Find out what that means to Lola in this episode. We also talk about being accidentally gender non-conforming, not relating to normative experiences, prioritizing action over language, the power in choosing our response, what we do versus who we are, the similarities between an unconventional gender journey and exploring alternative relationship styles, solidarity and the need to unite, the importance of understanding and regulating our nervous systems, and being safe within ourselves. To clarify some terminology that is used in the episode, F2M is female to male and AMAB is assigned male at birth. It was recorded on the 11th of June 2022. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Lola. Hello, Lola. Yeah, let's talk a bit about gender. The labels you gave me were agender, non-binary and queer. Um, Mm -hmm. So should we start with agender? What's it like for you to be agender? So I think that being agender is a little bit different to most things because it's literally just like not really understanding what gender is and Mm. how it applies to you and 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 just being like this just isn't a thing that applies to me Mm. a comparison that I sometimes make is that I kind of feel like it's people it's sort of like people who don't really get zodiac signs and you know when somebody kind of says oh you're being such a Libra or something they might be like I literally don't know what you mean by that and it means nothing to me and I don't necessarily identify with that so I kind of think it that's the best comparison is that it doesn't, it isn't something that I understand. I mean, it's something that I cognitively understand, but it's Mm. not something that I feel really applies to me. It's not something that I relate to in any way. It's Mm -hmm. not something that I feel like I feel internally Mm -hmm. at all. Um, And I think that makes it a slightly different to most, even though non-binary is is like a wider category, which includes a gender Mm-hmm. I can understand why some agender people don't feel non-binary or why they don't feel mm-hmm. like any other category covers them because yeah. there are so many other categories that do include feeling a certain gender or not. So yeah, that's the easiest way I can kind of explain it. It's just kind of feeling like none of those labels really apply to you or not really resonating with you in any way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And have you have you kind of always had a sense of that for as long as you can remember or? So I've had a different experience with gender growing up because I have a disorder called septooptic dysplasia. Part mm-hmm. of my disorder is um, it's generally a malformation of the brain that happens in utero and it affects parts of your brain, midline of the brain. Sometimes it affects blindness. It's uh, I'm blind to one eye and Mm -hmm. a lot of people with septoptic dysplasia are fully blind or have more intense kind of visual impairment than me. It also Mm -hmm. affects uh, because where your optic nerve is, that's where a septooptic comes from, is also next to your hormone producing centers. It affects a lot of your hormones. So I don't produce cortisol. I don't produce uh, thyroid hormone, growth hormone, or estrogen or testosterone. Um, Wow. So Mm -hmm. that has always had an impact on my life, 
because I grew up being very accidentally gender nonconforming. And Mm -hmm. I was also not economically, I was, I was, I wouldn't say I was below the poverty line. I was, my parents were not making very much money. There were a lot of children. My dad's mother was pretty wealthy. So it's not like I've kind of had no experience of any type of like middle-class wealth or even more than that. Mm -hmm. But day to day, we were pretty poor. I got free lunch. I got, you know, I didn't have loads of snacks or signs and things that I would kind of relate to being having a little bit higher of an economic class. And Mm -hmm. the way that impacted me in terms of clothes is that I didn't, I didn't get to choose my clothing. My Mm -hmm. clothing was bought for me by my grandma. That was mostly what I got or handed down to me from my sister. I didn't really get to choose what I wore until maybe I was 15, 16. I think that was the first time I went to a store and picked out something with my grandma. Mm -hmm. So I wore very feminine things because my grandma was the type of person, she wouldn't even get me a Game Boy because it said Game Boy. So she was not picking tomboy clothes for me. And I really Mm -hmm. had no desire to be a tomboy. I really Mm -hmm. liked pink. I really wanted to be feminine. And that could have partially been because I was so gender nonconforming. My mom also made the decision to cut my hair really short, very frequently. Mm -hmm. A few times that was like, literally because I had really bad lice for years and years. And that Mm -hmm. was how they dealt with it. But some of it was just my mom just saying, your hair doesn't look good long and cutting my hair long. So I didn't even get to grow my hair out long Mm -hmm. until I was much older. So I grew up looking very gender nonconforming. My first name that I was given that I went by at school was Amanda. And people would call me Amanda. And Mm. I was extremely targeted because of that. And I also had the experience, which I think also affected my kind of expression and feeling around gender of going by one name at school and going by another name at home. This kind Mm -hmm. of concept of a public and a private uh, identity is very normal to me. So Mm -hmm. in terms of like how I felt about being a gender, I didn't really know that because I was so targeted because I was not gender conforming enough. And people Mm -hmm. knew that I was a girl. Like I hung out with girls. I was also very terrified of boys because of sexual abuse I'd gone through. So Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't a tomboy and I had no desire to be. And I was very much targeted and very much picked on. And so I very much wanted to be a girl. I very much wanted to be feminine. And I looked forward to what I thought would be puberty, but I ended up having to take estrogen for the first time because I don't produce it. Mm -hmm. I really looked forward to that, not only because it was a sign that I was growing up and I didn't want to be a child, but also because I felt if I had breasts, at least people would have more signs of gender and they would stop picking on me. They didn't stop picking on me. I just got picked on for supposedly being a lesbian instead of being gender Mm -hmm. nonconforming. But I didn't really know that because I didn't have a chance to know that. I didn't really feel comfortable in, you know, I didn't have a choice of my expression. I didn't choose to cut my hair. I didn't choose the clothes I wore. Mm -hmm. So it was very much wanting to be feminine and wanting to be that because I wanted to stop being picked on. I wanted to stop being targeted. So the, Mm -hmm. the experience that I have I feel like a lot of non-binary people, specifically people who grow up, uh, who are identified as female at birth and grow up, I feel like there's like a euphoria in people like not knowing what gender you are. Not for me. Like Mm. if somebody is like, what, like if somebody were to ask me, that would be like what people did growing up bullying. Like that was how I was bullied is people constantly asking me if I'm a girl or a boy all the time. Mm. So that's not euphoric for me in any way, shape or form. So Mm -hmm. I didn't really have an understanding of that. I think I grew to understand that over time because I also went to an all women's university. I chose because I was kind of really paranoid and scared of the rape statistics in college campuses. I chose an all women's university. Mm -hmm. I barely got in on the skin of my teeth because of uh, my family's economic situation, but I chose an all women's university and, and that was, part of the experience of understanding that I was a gender, but earlier on, absolutely not. Because the last thing I wanted to be was 
not associated with the gender because I already was. And that was what brought so much bullying into my life. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So your, your condition was septo optic dysplasia. dysplasia. Yeah. Wow. Is that, is that related in any way to like intersex variations or not really? So, so this is the weird thing. Intersex as an umbrella the way the medical community defines it is very different to the way that the intersex community defines it. Right. So if you, if I asked my doctor, am I intersex because I don't have any kind of genital anomalies, he would say, no, you're not Mm -hmm. just taking your hormones makes you the same as everyone else. My personal experience is absolutely no, it does not. I did not have a puberty in the same way that most people have a puberty. I did take estrogen. I did develop, but this concept of being hormonal, I have no understanding of what that is. I don't mm. relate to it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And there could be a reason in terms of my hormones as to why I am a gender, although there are people with typical hormones who are a gender. Mm-hmm. But I, I do not feel like my experience within my own body and with, with hormones and all of that is normal. If I ask somebody in the intersex community, because I had a very big confusion growing up and, and, or sort of in my early twenties of like, do I count as intersex? Because I'm pretty sure my doctor would say no and has said no, because I don't have any genital, uh, you know, differences, Mm -hmm. but I do feel my experience is not the same. Like Mm -hmm. I, it is, it is not the same as somebody who has the same amount. And I don't feel like I do have the same amounts of estrogen. Maybe Mm -hmm. I do. I'm not sure. And I wasn't even allowed or given testosterone until I requested it, even though Mm -hmm. everyone makes estrogen and testosterone. So Mm -hmm. I don't feel like my experience is normative at all. And when I've asked intersex communities, they've been like, yeah, you do count because it's an umbrella term. It's about Mm -hmm. people whose bodies are different to the stereotypical or typical development mm-hmm. and that counts you would count under that mm-hmm. so yeah it's kind of a big confusion i think that yeah it's it, it would depend upon the person as to whether or not i would count or not yeah so between those mixed messages do you feel like it applies to you or do you feel like that describes you at least in part maybe how does it sit with you the, the label intersex i suppose I think it does when it comes to the normative experiences that people Mm -hmm. have, Yeah, you know, even just body hair. I don't have body hair. I've never grown armpit hair. I don't shave my armpits. And I originally wanted to take testosterone because I wanted to have body hair because Mm -hmm. I wanted to be normal. And growing up, one of the first things I kind of ended up discovering was, you know, not so great it, it was it was a type of feminism that was very t- anchored to the body and very much like this is, you know, we bleed in the cycles of the moon and and we're very much, you know, we, this is the experience of woman. And for a long time, I felt like I wasn't really a woman because I didn't have all of these things. Mm. I don't have a first period story. I knew exactly when my first period was coming because I took estrogen, birth control pills, in, in that form of estrogen to trigger mm-hmm. it. And I know when my period's coming, it's not, uh, I have a very light experience of it and mm-hmm. I don't have this connection that people have. And I'm not saying all women have like a connection to the moon or whatever, but mm-hmm. the experience of body, I don't feel is the same. And definitely, definitely the experience of being hormonal as a teenager, that is not something I relate to, not something I understood or feel like I experienced at all. Mm. in any way like maybe and I am kind of a little bit on the asexual spectrum as well and and maybe Mm. there was a little bit of that a little bit of interest but I don't that didn't come from my body that came from my mind so Mm. I I think that when I want to acknowledge though and I think it's really important to acknowledge in, in both when it comes to intersex and when it comes to gender that I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't operated on as an infant. And that is a specific trauma that I feel like is very important to fight and emphasize. And I don't want yeah. to 
you know, I'm not saying that me identifying as intersex takes away from that, but I, I feel like it's still really important to highlight, just as I now think it's very important to highlight that I know what it's like to be gender nonconforming because I was. I'm not really gender nonconforming now. And whether a person's cis or trans, they can be gender nonconforming. And that sometimes mm -hmm. creates extreme danger for them. And that is something that I would rather prioritize in my focus. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, sometimes, yes, if we're literally talking about bodies, if we're talking about differences, I will say, actually, not every single person has the exact same experience of their body when they mm -hmm. have, you know, different, you know, and I don't know what my phenotype is. So I don't, I don't know what genetically I am, but not everybody has that same experience. And I am an example of somebody who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, I find it an interesting one because at the moment, the whole um, what is a woman question is very much used as a gotcha, you know, type thing and to catch people out and stuff. And I feel like it's very much an experiential thing, really, in the end. I think that's why it's so difficult to define because although there is a collective experience of womanhood that I identify with as, as a human, you know, I identify with the woman experience. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's also like a very individual experience of womanhood. And just saying that, oh, if you haven't experienced this, then you're not a woman. Then you get into really dangerous territory, don't you? Because everyone has such a different experience. And it's up to yeah. people to tell. I feel like it's up to you to tell me who you are. It's not up to me to tell you who you are, you know? And if yeah, you said in, in your experience, like you feel very much a woman, then it's not up to me to say, oh, well, because you don't experience this. That does. Do you know what I mean? That's like, oh. It's such exactly. A, yeah. Yeah. I think we also run the risk a little bit sometimes in trying to make everything comfortable for, mm -hmm. for people. And I get it. I get why we should do that. But I also think we need to pay attention to people, people's feelings of how they actually identify. I think that, you know, people do identify as women and mm -hmm. that is really important to them and their experiences are really important to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes within a gender communities, I found it quite difficult when people assume that because they don't have a connection to gender, that anyone who does is kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not mm -hmm. true. People do identify as women. People identify with giving birth and, and that being a central part of their identity. Mm -hmm. They identify with going through the experiences of having a period like even if those aren't shared experiences that I have, people still have them. And, and, and that's still really important. And I think mm -hmm. we can have a world where we don't necessarily say that everyone's experience has to be flattened into one word that's suitable for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to have that. We can, we can, because I, I think the thing that I worry about, especially as like a non-binary person and as an agender person, you know, for example, when we talk about the abortion stuff that's happening in the U.S., like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. primarily that is affecting women. I absolutely understand that it could affect me. I mean, it won't because I don't I can't get accidentally pregnant with my disorder because I don't ovulate. Mm -hmm. But that is primarily affecting women and mm -hmm. a good majority of people who are women. You know, And I just feel like I don't feel alienated, even though I could need an abortion at some point. I don't need to feel alienated if somebody says this is a women's rights issue, this affects women. I just mm -hmm. feel like, you know, this is what, this is a specific thing. It just like I didn't, you know, I had a, an experience of poverty, but I still didn't have, it was very different to how some other people experienced it because I had a wealthy grandmother, but mm -hmm. I can still relate to discussions about free lunch and things like that. Like we're all going to have super individual, individualized experiences. Yeah. And what I don't want is, for people to feel like they can't, you know, that, that, that we have to, it's, it's okay to just say like, this is a women's issue because it is like, it really is. It, it, abortion is a women's issue. And I don't really feel like that should alienate people. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I get a little bit sort of frustrated because I feel like there's so much of a focus in trying to include me and trying to fix language to include me. Mm -hmm. And what I want is for my gender nonconforming friends and my trans friends to be able to walk down the street without getting yelled at. And I, I still have friends who can't go on the tube without getting yelled at, who can't go on the bus without getting yelled at. Mm. And 
I just, I just, I feel like sometimes there's a lot of focus on language and not necessarily like the action kind of falls by the wayside. And and I don't mean mm. to say that language isn't important by any means, but I just think that, you know, I can, I can recognize when something does or doesn't apply to me and not everything has to specifically speak to me to apply to me or not apply to me. And I, I just wish sometimes we had more of that because I think sometimes we get a little bit too focused on trying to change everything um, in a way that that could be alienating to somebody, mm. you know, and, and we have to kind of, I don't know, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm repeating myself, but we have to kind of, we, we, I think we should be a little bit nuanced and a little bit more flexible when it comes to that. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, any more thoughts on uh, the non-binary label or are you happy to move on to the queer label? <laughs> I think non-binary is super helpful for me because it's, I think, you know, theoretically, agender is under that. I can understand why some people don't Mm -hmm. identify uh, with the non-binary. I think it's it's interesting for me because within non-binary, like trans is also technically part of that, although, you know, people can be non-binary without identifying as trans. Mm -hmm. It's interesting for me because technically I was born with a body that matched my identity. I was Mm -hmm. born with a body that doesn't produce estrogen and testosterone. It's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to produce estrogen and testosterone, Mm -hmm. but it didn't. And that puts an interesting question as to whether or not I would identify as trans or can because I was born with a body that technically adhered to my identity when I was about 12 um, and I wasn't going into puberty on my own, my endocrinologist wanted me to start taking estrogen. Mm -hmm. And because I, you know, I I don't think that it would have been a good idea for me to get puberty blockers or to not take, I I wouldn't need puberty blockers. I would just not take any estrogen. There was Mm -hmm. a risk of osteoporosis. There were a few medical things to consider. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was an interesting time for me and but I think that the risk of not being on any hormones long term would have been not great for my health and I think that I don't you know I don't I'm not mad at the doctors or anything like that for deciding to give me estrogen and I I wanted estrogen at the time the mm-hmm. effects of it weren't things that I always wanted because I did get a reduction but I think it's interesting. I think for non-binary, I, I, I like it because it encompasses a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much like most of my identities are kind of umbrella terms, um, one or a couple of umbrellas that I fall under. And I think it's it's really helpful. And I can understand if people feel confused by things. Um, I can understand if people don't really get it. And that's fine. I think you don't always have mm-hmm. to get things. You know, you can sometimes just... yeah just be okay with it. And, and as long as it's not hurting you and as long as people are being kind to you, because people can be really nasty and I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as people are, are kind to you, then I think that it's, it's fine. But the other thing that I think that I would add about being non-binary is the thing that worries me a little bit. I wish that we had a better understanding of non-binary from a neutral source The thing that worries me a little bit, and I mean, there's no real neutral source, but like the thing Mm -hmm. that worries me a little bit about the way that people learn about this stuff now Mm -hmm. is that it's primarily through if they if they don't read it in a book, which is very unlikely that they will or see it on TV, which is more more likely now, which I'm very I'm I'm more or less excited about that. Mm -hmm. But they learn it through communities. And I sometimes feel like the communities are encouraging one way to think about gender and about existing as a non-binary person that Mm -hmm. I think actually causes more stress than it relieves. So there's a really amazing, my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes in the world is from Viktor Frankl. And it says, uh, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And it's not just within the trans community, but I feel like a lot of communities online are basically encouraging people to believe that they have no power to choose their response, that they have no power Mm. there. And 
they can only react. And the responsibility, therefore, is never on themselves to choose a response, but on everybody else to mm. control whatever they're saying and make sure whatever they're saying matches everyone else so that they never cause a bad response. And I don't think that that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I think obviously there are gender nonconforming people. As I said, there are people who go outside who are attacked and that's bullshit and that shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think it's so important for people to learn instead of, I feel like personally for me, and I said this when I went to the gender identity clinic, I was mm -hmm. born into a society that doesn't really have non-binary as an option. My choices there, therefore then are, I can be seen as a woman, I can be seen as a man, or I can be seen as something that confuses people. I've already done that. That isn't fun for me. I don't have any desire to confuse people. I don't want to hear people asking me what gender I am. I, I don't really want to do that. And also, I don't necessarily want to dress masculine. Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't really fit my body well. It doesn't feel comfortable. Forcing myself to be ultra masculine would be the exact same as forcing myself to be super feminine. It doesn't work for me. I wouldn't really describe myself as androgynous. I feel like I'm somewhat more feminine, but that's mm -hmm. because I'm more or less a goth and goth has a, mm -hmm. a goth has a presence of a, an ungendered feminine goth has a, within the community, like men and women wear eyeliner, men and women paint their nails. There is in the goth community, femininity is not necessarily only for women. So mm. I don't feel like the feminine things that I do are connected to womanhood. Okay. They're more connected to being goth. Okay. So what, what are my choices then? I can, you know, my name is Lola. People are going to see that they're going to call me she. They just mm -hmm. are. They're not going to call me they. Even if I change my name to a gender neutral name, quote unquote, and who knows what will happen in 10 years if that name will become less gender neutral because mm -hmm. Ashley used to be a boy's name. They'll just ask me what gender I am or they'll assume. That is just the mm -hmm. way that the society is in which I live. There is nothing I can really do within the short lifetime I have to change that. I really mm -hmm. can't. I will try. I try to make influences, try to encourage people to ask about pronouns, but there really isn't anything I can do. Mm -hmm. So in my power to choose my response, what can I do? I can get upset every single time someone calls me a she. I can assume that they don't care about me. I can assume that they disrespect who I am. Or I can understand that maybe they don't know anything about being non-binary. They still care about me and they still want to connect with me. Mm -hmm. And I can decide that I'm not going to immediately cut them off in my head just because they've done this. Mm -hmm. And also that it's just a part of the society that we live in and it's not personal and it's not about me. Mm. And I have been gendered correctly by people who have been nasty and disgusting to me. And I've been misgendered by people who have treated me with nothing but kindness. Mm. The community, I feel like way too much encourages people to assume completely that by pronouncing you correctly, this is the, this is the entire representation of their feelings about you. It encourages people to abandon their power to choose their response. Again, this is very separate to people who are gender nonconforming, who get attacked in the street. That is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you get attacked in the street, which you shouldn't be, of course, you're going to respond in an upset way. Mm -hmm. But what I think that I'm kind of worried about is that because people are learning about this, going online, going into communities where people have decided that, you know, this is how we're going to handle the situation. We have no power to choose our response. Therefore, you must do everything in your power to make sure you don't upset anyone by something that you said. Mm -hmm. I think that causes more stress. That takes our power away from ourselves and mm -hmm. allows somebody else. Nobody can actually misgender you unless they have the power to gender you in the first place. And they don't. Mm -hmm. You only have the power to gender yourself. Nobody else has that power. They can decide if they want to see you as a certain gender, but you don't have to agree. And mm -hmm. I feel like there is a way to navigate gender dysphoria. There's a way to navigate the you know difficult feelings that people feel whilst giving people their power back. And I feel like too much of the community encourages people to release their power to others to an extent that it causes them anguish. And mm -hmm. I actually feel, I you know, I went to the gender identity clinic to get my breast reduction, I was very clear about what I wanted. And I feel like I was almost 
not distressed enough for them to give me give me what I wanted because mm. I said like look I'm gonna be I'm gonna be called she even if I change my name unless I present and unless I bind my chest or really present as a very masculine person in which case they mm. call me he which is not right either this is just the society that I live in you know because mm -hmm. I wasn't bothered by that the people at the gender I clinic gender identity clinic assumed that I was fine <laughs> and that's mm. not and that I didn't need any help or didn't need any medical assistance and I did I was still very gender distressed about my chest mm. so I would like people to understand that you as a non-binary person unfortunately exist mostly in a society there are lots of other societies where they they you know they might experience different things and I'm specifically talking about the society I live in so it doesn't apply to you you know mm -hmm. um but generally speaking most I th people who would listen to this I feel like live in a society that doesn't recognize non-binary people this sucks in a lot of ways mm -hmm. but there's lots of ways that you can be validated there's lots of ways you can validate yourself there's lots of ways that you can acknowledge yourself that don't have to rely on everybody using the right pronouns for you that don't have to rely on every button, you know, nobody ever making a mistake around you. Mm. Please try and step outside a little bit of the way that people are encouraging you to think the way that people are encouraging you to believe that if somebody misgenders you, they don't really see you for who you are. It's mm. not as simple as that the world is complex and nuanced. And actually, you have the power to choose your response. Sometimes you'll get a bit upset and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's fine. You're human. I'm not saying you're perfect and Vulcan and, and nothing ever gets to you, but understand mm. that you actually have more power than you think you have. Mm. Yeah. I like that. That's a very empowering way to look at it, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's a little bit better just rather than just seeing the world as happening to you, mm. you do have the power to exist. Mm. And, and again, like if you're going outside and being attacked, for being gender non-conforming, that is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. that should not be happening. And that's why I think that should be a huge focus, you know, of, mm -hmm. of, of movements of change. I want yeah. people, you know, I don't want people to learn. I'd rather people, instead of like trying to call me they, I'd, I'd much rather people learn conflict, like how to, how to resolve conflict or how to intervene if someone's being attacked. Mm. Like, that's what I would rather people learn. Like, to be honest, it's not that I don't want people to care about me. And I know like people might say, but Lola, we can do both, but we're not doing both. I feel personally, mm. I would much rather people learn how to stop someone in, who's getting attacked and stop, you know, speak up when someone is being harassed and, and learn conflict mediation and, and those skills mm. rather than always getting my pronoun right. That's for me personally, what I would have rather people mm -hmm. do. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. So where does the queer fit in for you? So for me, it's also very interesting because I grew up with a gay mom. Um, my mom came out probably when I was about three. However, I still believed and still thought she was with my dad because they were still living together. The summation of that is basically um, the relationship between my mom and dad wasn't very good, to mm. say the least. My dad wasn't very nice to my mother to put it lightly. And my mom agreed to stay because the kids needed a family, blah, 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 that type of thing. And my dad kicked her out randomly one night when I was 12. But I knew that my mom was gay. I knew that she had girlfriends, but I still thought that she was with my dad. Mm -hmm. My mom, I feel, had a very defensive response to the concept of bisexual people. The mm -hmm. idea that somebody could choose to not be attracted to women or to, you know, that I think she was very threatened by that. So she said a lot of biphobic things growing up, you know, that bi right. people needed to pick a side. She also, I think, had a very defensive response as a femme lesbian in the butch femme community mm -hmm. to lesbians who weren't butch or femme. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that came from, you know, she told me she had, she had, received very poor treatment in the lesbian community for being a femme lesbian who was interested in butch women, that she had been told that she was emulating straight relationships, things like that. Mm. Um, my mom did overshare with me things that maybe she shouldn't. But mm. um, so I grew up knowing this about my mom, being with her, like my first pride parades with, were with my mom. 
Um, they weren't, you know, I didn't have that experience of like going to gay clubs and that being my first experience, but mm -hmm. I also didn't really know that I was queer. And this was primarily because, because I had experienced sexual abuse and I was terrified of men uh, or boys. It was very clear to me when I had a crush on one because I wasn't afraid of them. <laughs> Whereas like when I had a crush on women and I now very distinctly remember when I had a crush on women or girls, because mm -hmm. I just really liked them and wanted to be like them. And it's, it's obvious to me now, like the, the favors that I did for them that I really didn't do for my friends. It, it's very obvious, but I didn't have any concept of that. And like I said, because I, the bullying in my life switched from being, um, you're not feminine enough or you're, you're, you're gender non conforming to now you're a lesbian every school that I went to, I, people just assumed I was a lesbian because I was terrified of boys and I never hung out with them. And I showed no interest in them because mm -hmm. they terrified me. And because I got really panicked, which may have been a, I don't know if this was a gender associated thing, but changing in the locker room really freaked me out. And I wasn't happy. Um, mm -hmm. And mostly because I was afraid that if, if I got caught staring at a girl, that I would then be attacked or something like that. So I, I didn't, didn't like the locker room. So mm. I, you know, I was bullied a lot for being a lesbian. And, and the last thing that I ever wanted to be was what they said that I was. Mm. Um, and I also, like I said, I'm a bit on the ace spectrum. I'm kind of, mm. I, I associate a little bit with the demisexual identity a little bit. I feel like a, it's not fully there, but if you don't know what demi is, basically you don't experience sexual attraction to someone unless you have a, an emotional bond with them. Mm -hmm. And I know some people might be like, oh, that's everyone. It's not everyone mm -hmm. because people do experience sexual attraction to people. They just aren't willing to jump into bed with them right away. That's very different. Mm -hmm. A demisexual person like literally doesn't experience sexual attraction to somebody without mm -hmm. an emotional bond. Um, and given the experiences that I had growing up, an emotional bond was very easy for me to have with people. And so I struggled to really see that I was actually attracted to women because the attraction that I had to women wasn't innately sexual because I, I think I also kind of pushed it down a little bit because I didn't want it to be. Um, yeah. But also because I had this kind of, I didn't experience like the rush or like, that's another experience of teen adolescence that I, I have no connection with. Like I don't, I, I had crushes on people, but it was from my mm -hmm. mind that it wasn't a body thing at all. Um, okay. So I, I had a hard time pinning that down. And then I was, I also played this game. A lot of people play this game called the like straight people do that. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, straight. There were so many things that I did, like being interested in boobs. I was like, lots of straight women are interested in boobs. You know, that doesn't mean I'm gay. Like that kind of a thing. <laughs> Yeah. Until I kind of got to the point of like, oh, I'd be willing to have sex with a woman. A straight woman probably would too. Like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe <laughs> not so much. <laughs> yeah. um, and I actually, uh, because I was super interested in sexual health and for a while I wanted to be a sex therapist and I was like, I became a peer sexual health educator and I was, I was really nerdy about it and I learned all the things and I found like really good queer porn one series mm -hmm. called uh, Crash Pad, which is amazing. You should definitely check it out. Um, cool. It's got lots of body diversity in it. It's a very, it's, it's an awesome, awesome, uh, very ethically made, awesome thing. Nice. And there was a, there was a, a, a porn star in that called Jiz Lee, who was non-binary and yeah. I was very attracted to them. So I was like, oh crap, I guess maybe I am, you know, a little gay or bi or queer or mm -hmm. something, you know, like I'm clearly not only ever attracted to cis head straight men. So, mm -hmm. um, I felt like the I was in the community for a long time because I had all that history and, and it's very complicated. Um, I kind of sometimes wish I had that introduction to the queer community because, um, because the relationship between my mom and I isn't so great. Now, some of the best, like the earliest, connections I have with the queer community are very connected to memories of my mom, which is some, sometimes a little bit painful, but I am, I am glad. Like it's always felt like home. My mom had a gay best friend who I saw and grew up around a lot, even though the first prides that I went to were in Virginia and they were not big celebrations. They were like, you know, small barbecues in the park, hoping nobody came by and harassed us. You know, I, I, I do feel super connected to that community and it does 
it does feel like home. Sometimes I'm a little bit frustrated with, I feel like a lack of focus on, on youth because I, I was also an LGBT youth worker in London for about a decade. And that might be just me sour grapes, but I, I do feel connected to the idea of queerness. I, I like the idea of queerness. It, I think, could encompass gender identity as well. And there are some political aspects of it that I like. Um, I also used to give a talk about the history of Stonewall, which I think is really important for people to know about because there's a lot of actual misunderstanding mm -hmm. about the history of Stonewall. Um, right. But I think it's it's super important. Some of my earliest memories, other than Pride, were being really involved in the marriage equality movement in uh, California with my mom, you know, standing outside with having people shout, like, get your hands off marriage in my face, like really intense, you know, mm. protests against this bad experiences in the US of Congress people, you know, comparing my mom to a child molester for just for who she loved. And, mm. you know, that is there's positives and negatives in there. But there's, you know, it's a big part of, of who I am. Yeah, I like that. Because for me, I like to use the term queer. And for me, I feel like it incorpor incorporates like, everything. It's also a bit fuzzy. To me, it's kind of, it's very open and expansive, but also like, I find it hard to define or communicate like exactly what it means to me. Um, yeah. 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 And what I, what I love about it too is actually, which may, may, may be different to some people is that some people mm -hmm. really don't identify as queer. Some people yeah. have too much of a negative connotation with the word. Mm. to feel connected to it in any positive way. And I really respect those people. Totally. And I try not to use queer as a catch-all for LGBTQ people for that reason. Mm -hmm. But I think that that is, is one of the things that I think shows the nuance of the community and shows that not everybody has the exact same opinion. And totally. that's okay. We don't mm -hmm. have to have the exact same opinion. And what I also just really love about about queer is that foundationally um if you if you follow anybody on instagram uh you should follow alok and i'm sure you've probably talked oh, about yes. alok before I love alok. um yeah so many good understandings and book reports about the construction of gender and about mm -hmm. you know and 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 the thing that we have to really understand is that it's it's a very strange thing technically for us to define ourselves by our sexuality there were queer people all throughout history, but it wasn't who you were. It was just something you did. And mm -hmm. it was something you did in some cultures that could cause great shame and great shock, but mm -hmm. it wasn't connected to who you were. And over time, it became a label that was used for the summation of you as a person. And mm -hmm. technically, I think if we want to step towards a more liberatory future, we should step away from seeing ourselves as only this thing and mm. just this thing. And I think it's complicated, right? Because I mean, yeah. like Foucault, the famous philosopher has said so many things about how, you know, oppression creates, um, you know, the, the things that it creates is not just pain, but also we become defined by it. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really difficult because we get, you know, told that we are bad because of this thing. And that defines our experience mm. as human beings and as human beings, one thing that's very true about all of us is that we need connection. We have survived this long, hundreds and hundreds of years because of our connection to one another mm -hmm. to be outcasted in, you know, when we look at previous human societies to be kicked out of your, your village, your group meant death. Mm -hmm. You had mm -hmm. to be with the group. And so the, the risk of being disconnected and kicked out is a huge, you know, activates the same centers in our brain as pain. Mm -hmm. Like it's not good. And that's why sol you know, solitary confinement is torture mm -hmm. because we need to be connected with one another. And mm -hmm. so when we get told that we're bad because of this thing, that does have a huge impact on us as humans. And, you know, it shapes who we are. And I, but I think it's still possible for us to understand its power on us Mm -hmm. without again making it all of who we are and and making it yeah. you know understanding that there's different ways mm -hmm. that we can exist and i just again like i get really anxious about the the way that especially online that communities get and the way it sort of seems like you have to agree with this way or you have to you know i got mm -hmm. chewed out by someone once because i used the word ftm because mm -hmm. i actually have um another member of my family who's trans Mm -hmm. And that's what he uses for himself 
it may be an yeah. outdated term, but that's what he yeah. uses for himself. And yeah. I was just basically told that like, you're, you know, it's, you know, you're being transphobic because you're using FTM. And I was like, but yeah. this is my, this is what my, the words but that, that's you what know. you know about this person. Right. And I've yeah. had two guests on the podcast that also use the term and actually gave me that as, you know, part of yeah. the labels for their episode. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, we, we run the risk of really alienating parts of parts of our own community and everybody else when we decide, okay, this is how language has changed. This is the only language you can use. And if you don't use this language, then you yeah. are bad. And I just, queer is such a good example of how that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because so many people, there are very, very many people who don't identify as queer for very good reasons that should be respected and, mm -hmm. and, and should be absolutely fine. And there are many yeah. people who do identify as queer for very big reasons that also should be fine. And mm -hmm. so I think that especially if we're going to be a community that says that we should respect how people identify, mm -hmm. then we should respect how everyone identifies. And to a, to a certain extent, you know, we also have to be aware that straight and, and that word wasn't sort of taken on by people who are straight as, as a neutral mm. term for a while. And so yeah. it, it's, it's understandable that some people are going to react to being told they're cis with like, what, what yeah. is that even like, Yes, yeah. it's a chemistry term. And yes, it does have a history that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But you can't, in out of the one side of your mouth, say you should respect me and call me they because I, you know, in terms of my own principles, I can't mm -hmm. say you should call me they and respect me for being non-binary while at the same time say, I'm going to call you this thing. And, and mm -hmm. if, even if you don't like it, I don't care as much yeah. as I think people will be pissed off about that. Like, I'm sorry, but like, mm. we do have to have a little bit more of a nuanced approach to how we, how we approach things. And queer is a perfect example of how nuance mm. can function just fine within the community. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. Yeah. Mm. So you also, you educate about non-monogamy and you've got a book out. Is it out right now or is it coming um, out? It's on, it's on pre-order now, ah, but it will yeah. be out, I think on the 21st of January or June. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah. Time. What is time? Yeah. 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 Is that about non-monogamy as well? What is it about? Yeah. So it's called the anxious person's guide to non-monogamy and yes. ideally Basically, I felt like within the podcast and because I write, I do a podcast in a column and mm -hmm. I felt like I was repeating some of the same things. Um, yeah. And I feel like my position within this, which is which is also very interesting. I feel like I'm never committing to any one identity. Right. Like, yeah, I don't I, I don't really identify as internally polyamorous or like mm -hmm. I don't have to be polyamorous. I don't feel like it's part of my identity. Mm -hmm. That is an identity that I feel like is very much something I do not something that I am. And mm -hmm. it's not to say that I don't care about it, but I could choose to be monogamous. It's not, it's not something mm -hmm. that I, I personally, and I think from that point of view, it, it makes it a little bit easier sometimes to talk about the, the difficulties sometimes people have, because I might have a little bit more difficulties because I don't feel like it's an inherent part of me. That isn't something that I can use to say like, oh, but this is who I am when mm -hmm. uh, non-monogamy becomes difficult. But I think that it's, I'm hoping that it helps people who are just starting out, maybe people who have done it for a while, but are, are still kind of dealing with, you know, most like I'd say nine, nine out of 10 times, my column is, is telling people it's okay if they have feelings and that, you know, they don't, there's an enormous mm -hmm. amount of pressure because most people know about non-monogamy to a certain extent. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. way more known about than it used to be. Yeah. Um, they know about open relationships, but most people know about it and think it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. there is a huge kind of pressure, I think, non-monogamous people put on themselves to make, you know, to show that they can do it in a mm -hmm. way that they don't pressure themselves around monogamy. You know, if they if they break yeah. up in monogamous relationships, it's not that monogamy doesn't work. It's just a yeah. breakup. So I feel like I'm hoping that it will help people kind of understand that it's it makes sense if you grew up in a society that is monogamous for the most part. You didn't even know this was an option in your entire mm -hmm. life you've been thinking about being in a monogamous relationship, sometimes even pretending to be in one when you're younger. And every bit of, bit of media you see is, is a, has monogamous relationships in it. And yeah. it's, it's going to make sense that you can't come from that and then mm. go into non-monogamy and not have any feelings about it. Like, of course you're going to have feelings about it. Like, 
Of totally. course you are. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot like you know all the options we get for relationships and gender and sexuality and all the things. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like these are the these are the boxes you were allowed to fit in, and mm-hmm. the rest like no, that's not acceptable. You know. Yeah. So, or yeah. you just don't even know it's there. So yeah, like that's an option. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 So it's just mm-hmm. hopefully making people feel like oh, okay, these are the things that will help kind of ground me a little bit because Mm -hmm. a lot of the things that ground monogamous people, they kind of take for granted. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you have, there's a concept called the relationship escalator, which is, is really Mm -hmm. good to Google. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, you have a cultural script that you meet someone, you date for a while, you get married, you, you, those Mm -hmm. things really ground you and you, you feel comfortable, even though technically there is nothing that that guarantees that your partner will stay with you there really isn't like Mm -hmm. you hope that you both are committed to one another but you can't really control that but because of all these cultural scripts you are kind of really low like kind of lulled into a false sense of security in a way um but it helps you feel grounded and when you don't have that within monogamy or non-monogamy and your partner isn't you know you don't have the exclusivity factor which also can kind of ground you a little bit and make mm-hmm. you feel special, then you have to come up with your own ways to ground yourself. And that can be really hard if you if you have no idea how to do that. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm hoping that it it helps people feel a little bit more grounded. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. I will read it. I look forward to reading it actually, because I feel like in my own journey with non-monogamy, polyamory, mm-hmm. it's been very, again, I feel like even in the, I don't know if you call it subgroups or like alternative mm-hmm you know anything really Mm -hmm. you're then it's kind of like similar to gender I suppose it's almost like oh yeah there are other options and here are the rules for that option you know Mm. and you get another rule book to go with the with you you throw out one one rule book and you just get another one you know it's kind of like that and I've discovered that it's very much about me really looking inside and looking at what do I want what do I need and how do I bring that into my life you know how do I let that in um Mm -hmm. and yeah it helps you address like all sorts of things like I discovered I was well discovered you know I'd always been that but it's like it Mm -hmm. really did shine a light on some of the issues that I've kind of well always had but was never really aware of like being a people pleaser that's just how I was brought Mm -hmm. up um being this perfectionist and like needing to get things right and Mm -hmm. having no boundaries at all Mm. you know all Mm. this stuff and it really helped to shine a light on that so I feel like exploring alternative relationship styles as it were has taught me a lot about myself and even if I were to be like okay actually monogamy is the way for me and that's what it's going to be like I have learned so much that is going to help me in my relationships, whatever style they are, with friendships, intimate ones, you know, all all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So, and I feel like it's just been really valuable in that way, like the the self knowledge I've acquired, and you know, self acceptance as well, and all that mm-hmm. stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. I think it's actually very similar to gender in that, like, the journey can teach you a lot. Sometimes people can go on the journey and it doesn't teach them anything. <laughs> But the journey can teach you a lot. There's lots of things that I think monogamous people can challenge and should challenge because Mm. I don't think it helps them either. Just like I don't think that you have to be trans or be non-binary to challenge some of the gender roles that get given. And the gender roles are extremely harmful and Mm. and not helpful at all to many, many cisgender people. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, in, in a defensive way, I think a lot of polyamorous people end up kind of enforcing a status quo within their communities because when you get told again that you're like you know you're this isn't the way you do this this isn't the way you do this this isn't how you should do this Mm -hmm. sometimes you have a very defensive reaction to it of like no actually this is the best way (laughs) your way is really bad and I think you can have the similar things within gender of you know we get to a point where we're kind of talking down people who don't belong in the community And understandably, part of that is defense, part of that is blowing off steam, part of that is being really frustrated within a world that, you know, doesn't kind of fully accept you and trying to carve out your own niche, because we need to belong as human beings. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, just with just as within the polyamory community, the thing that I really don't like about it sometimes is is the talking down to monogamous people is making out that Mm -hmm. monogamous people are less evolved or less you know monogamous people are fully capable of going on journeys 
and really challenging mm. some of the things that monogamy yeah. has taught them or even monogamous culture has taught them because that's mm-hmm. not inherent to monogamy and gender as well. Like gender roles are not inherent to gender. People who are cis um, are fully capable of challenging some of those preconceptions and yeah. don't necessarily have to identify or move within their gender identity to do so. So mm-hmm. I think it's it's super important. I understand the defensiveness there. I absolutely can understand that. Mm-hmm. I just hope that people also kind of can understand that at the end of the day, my personal goal as a human being is to make the world a better place. In order to do that, I I can't stay within my silos. I can't stay within my communities. I can't only interact with people who fully understand and accept me. Mm-hmm. I have to go out and, and branch out a little bit. Pride is is one of the best movies. If you've never seen the film Pride, uh, I would mm. definitely check it out. It's about the miners' strike um, and about the the community, the gays and lesbians support the miners' group and how those wow. two communities came mm. together. And this uh-huh. is the perfect example of how important solidarity is and how powerful it can be. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people I feel like I've come across in today who would never help the miners, who would be like, no, they're homophobic whatever, I don't want to deal with them. Mm. And I think that it's really important for us to understand solidarity. And it's if we want the world to change, solidarity is the biggest thing. One Mm. of the groups that formed after Stonewall, a little bit of a a history lesson, Mm -hmm. um, was the the GAA, I believe it was. I'm I'm faulting on the name right now. But the first group that formed after Stonewall Uh, Before Stonewall, a lot of the gay groups didn't have gay in the title because they were too afraid to. So Mm. you had um, the homophiles was the word that they would often use or the Daughters of Belitis, which was a lesbian group. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them didn't have, didn't actually have the word gay in it. I think the Gay Activist Alliance, I think that was the, one of them was the first one. So it's like the GLA and the GAA. And one of the first groups that formed after actually broke apart and mostly because they couldn't agree on whether or not to only focus on gay causes. And there was a a motion in the group that came because the Black Panthers came to support, uh, the Stonewall wasn't one night, it was was seven nights, it was multiple nights. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the first groups that showed up among among, uh, anti-war protesters was the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were super supportive of the Stonewall riots. And, you know, there is an obvious, it's not the gay community and the Black community, there's obviously a large amount of of gay black and uh, gay people of color but Mm -hmm. the original encouragement in the group the original kind of thing that they brought up was should we help the black panthers because they helped us and some people didn't want to because they were homophobic and Mm -hmm. that broke apart the group that was one of the key issues that ended up causing the group to disband and form into different groups some which focused on wider solidarity some which only focus on on gay on gay issues quote unquote Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I think that what we can learn from both this and the film Pride and and what happened with the gays and lesbians support the minors is that it's really, really important for us to to form, to to not get so siloed in our communities, to not get to the point where we're unable to relate to people and, and, and that we're able to deal with the fact that like, okay, some people may not understand us. Some people won't get that I'm non-binary, but we could actually work together and Mm -hmm. and to to a common good and and what i'd love to see is you know instead of understand like starbucks starbucks would love to put pronouns on their company's badges on their employees badges but they don't want their employees to unionize and and that is the thing that you really need to Mm -hmm. be wary of some of the things that are are easily taken up by capitalism and by big institutions that actually rob people of their power. They don't hate you that much. They will take a little bit of you if it means that they can keep the power. Mm-hmm. So be very, very wary. That's one of the reasons why I don't like this kind of focus on the community on, on things that I feel like don't really actually reflect solidarity because mm-hmm. they will take, they'll put pronouns on their employees' badges. They will learn what non-binary is. They'll hang the flags. But are they giving their employees enough vacation time? Are they paying people mm-hmm. well enough? Like, mm-hmm. it's not to say that classism is the only thing people should care about. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that be very, very wary mm-hmm. of the way that some of these things can be taken up. And, and we should really focus 
in my opinion anyway, on building solidarity. And I feel like we're going to have a harder time building solidarity if we are so focused on some of the things that corporations can pick up easily, but people may actually struggle with. Mm. Yeah, fighting amongst ourselves, aren't we? <laughs> Too much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, one thing I've I've sort of learned from doing this is like, yeah, the whole intersectional thing mm -hmm. and how we are all affected by this system. And although we might think this is not about me, this is about them, this is about someone else, it really isn't, you know. It's about like the oppressed and the minorities and the marginalized people and how we should, you know, yeah, all unite together rather than get lost in details and fight about language, I suppose. <laughs> and that's you know? what I think yeah. that helps helps the people in power separate totally. divide and conquer mm. helps the people in power and and intersectionality if you really think about it like as it is as it's as it became it was about like uh, you know Kimberly Crenshaw if I remember correctly and the idea that you know somebody doesn't have like a black experience and a woman experience somebody like it's it's more complicated and nuanced than that mm. but I think that if you look you know, there are people who who absolutely do have something in common with you. Most of the world isn't somebody isn't aren't people that pe that are untouched by any form of oppression. Most mm. people are touched in some way or another. Yeah, and that is a is a means of uh, they may not feel the exact same way you do about it, but you know, one of the first people who recognized me as non-binary before I even called myself non-binary actually was my great aunt, my great aunt Linda she had given me a gift. And before I even really knew, she kind of said to me, I think that might be too sissified for you, which isn't like mm -hmm. necessarily a nice thing to say. And, mm -hmm. and this isn't, isn't the terms we would use. But yeah. her perception of that is like, oh, I see that you are not feminine in this way. And I wasn't a tomboy either. And I mm -hmm. recognize that there is something different there. And mm -hmm. I respect that. Yeah. In her own way, she said that. So I just think like most people have some experience and it benefits the people in power for us to focus on all the ways that we're different and all mm -hmm. the ways that we make mistakes with each other and all the ways that we're not similar and yeah. all the ways that this, you know, machine hurts us and hurts us as individuals. And I don't think like, I don't mm. think we should necessarily never talk about that. But I think that there's there's ways that it hurts everyone and even even men even you know the cis head white men mm -hmm. who you know people <laughs> don't like like they are affected and i think there are totally. a lot of men who can understand that gender roles have an impact on their lives mm -hmm. and they face a physical threat like i was gender nonconforming but people still saw me as a girl like they kind of knew i was a girl they mm -hmm. just didn't see me as girly enough if mm -hmm. i was if I had been born and and I as AMAB or had been seen as a man and mm. I was feminine, I would have had a completely different experience, a very yeah. physically threatening experience. And I am mm. am not ignorant to that fact. The things that men men know about men's violence, they mm. know it intimately and have for a very long time. And the way that we deal with this, in my opinion is by actually engaging people and trying to see what we have in common because we are more alike than we are different. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't talked about yet? Um, one thing that I think is really important for people actually, and, and has been really helpful for my mental health and mm -hmm. in dealing with you know, gender stuff and everything else is understanding my nervous system. Mm. I think that it's very easy to, especially if you struggle with anxiety, especially if you deal with anything associated with, you know, not so great mental health, mm -hmm. to feel like your brain is your enemy, your brain is not helping you at all and making things worse. When I understood my nervous system and when I understood that, hey, when I'm upset, like, my nervous system is going nuts, but my nervous system is trying to protect me mm -hmm. and trying to help actually. And I think I was, I was probably in a constant state of nervous system agitation for a mm -hmm. very long time. Yeah. We don't live in a, in a society that helps our nervous system mm -hmm. because 
especially digitally, and I, I think social media, and I think um, being online is fantastic. And I don't think it's like all bad and evil, and you should never be connected in any of that. I think it has a great power and potential for social connection that is really, really good. But understand that humans respond to negative stimulus because we have had to respond to it for, for centuries. Mm-hmm. We live very differently. And I'm not saying things were better when we like died of preventable diseases or anything. But we live very differently now to how our ancestors lived for ages. And our Mm. brains are still very much guided by how our ancestors lived. And so if you think about like constant negative news, constant, um, especially in the UK, with the amount of negative uh, trans, anti-trans media coming out, Mm. understand that the constant negativity, your brain will pay attention to it because it's trying Mm. to keep you alive. But that has an impact on you. It has an impact on your nervous system. Mm -hmm. I was constantly agitated and it made it easier for me. It it, it got to a point where I would get angry because being angry felt nicer than being scared. Mm -hmm. And I would get angry over anything. I look back at my Facebook posts and like, I'm so angry all the time. And Mm. it's not to say that the world isn't a thing that will make you angry because there's lots of things Mm -hmm. to be angered about. But again, you have the power to choose different things. And I really, really feel like, especially for people in the UK, Sean Fay did like an amazing um, series of tweets a while back ago about Mm. the YouGov polls in the UK of people's uh, opinions about self-ID. Most Mm -hmm. people in the UK were pro self-ID. And I think that it's very easy to digest all of this media coming at you Mm. and feel terrible all the fucking time. Mm. And that makes it so hard for you to actually Mm. learn anything. And I think yeah. People people are walking around with very not balanced nervous systems and then we expect them to be able to learn and uh, and understand mm. that like you can't like it's it's a it's a biological fact that when your nervous system is in a fight or flight situation or or fawn or freeze you can't learn anything. Mm-hmm. I very much fear that people are not actually learning things when it comes to to social issues. I don't want people to, when they get told that they've said something transphobic or they've done that, they go into a fight or flight situation. They Mm -hmm. aren't, you know, maybe they don't yell at me. Maybe they don't walk away. Instead, they fawn and they repeat exactly what they think they've been told that they should repeat, but they're Mm -hmm. not actually learning anything. And I really, really fear that people are fawning a lot. And that is why we're getting activist fatigue. That is why we're getting people who don't know what to do. Should I post the black square? Should I not post? Like they make short, quick decisions because their Mm -hmm. nervous systems are triggered and they need to respond because if they don't respond, then they're bad and they make poor decisions and then they get exhausted. And that Mm -hmm. affects so many more issues than I think just trans and, and gender issues. But I think that understanding how to balance your own nervous system brings you to a better place to understand the quote that I said of between stimulus and response, there is a space. Mm -hmm. If your nervous system is out of complete, like if you're constantly upset or not even upset, but just constantly Mm hypervigilant, you won't, of course, that quote that I've just said to you is going to be like, what are you talking about? There's no space there. There's no space. I just respond. Um, learning about my nervous system has helped me so much in so many ways. And Mm. it's one of those things, like I said, instead of like, and okay, I'm not saying people shouldn't learn about pronouns or care about that. Like, it's not what I'm saying, but I think, you know, conflict resolution, if we're going to be able to confront people Mm. or help people who are being targeted and and harassed in public, it's harder for you to do that with an out of, out of balance nervous system. And that's not to say you're going to be totally calm as a cucumber. If you, you witness a, a hate crime in action, you're not, mm-hmm. you're going to mm-hmm. have a nervous system response. Yep. But when you actually learn your nervous system, when you're capable of self-regulating it a little bit, you can understand that there is that space and it's so much easier to mm-hmm. live. It's so much easier to deal with the world because you understand that you have the power to like step away certain times. You don't put so much pressure on yourself. I think that if you, if you want something that will help you 
with gender. I do think understanding your nervous system is a big thing. Understanding that your brain is just trying to help you survive. Your brain, you know, it doesn't know that you've received a an email that's upset it upset you. It just knows that this is the fight time and it's doing the same thing that it would if you saw a an apex predator animal that's going to kill you. Mm-hmm. It's just doing what it's like literally programmed to do for after centuries of evolution. Mm-hmm. So trying to understand that will help you immensely. It will help you improve your relationship with social media and with online communities. It will help you learn how to deal with, you know, people being jerks. It will help you in so many mm-hmm. ways. So I would recommend like, you know, look, looking up things about the nervous system um, there are a few accounts that I could give you. Like, I, I like to follow things on Instagram because it allows me to read things without like having to sit down and like digest stuff. But there's tons of things mm-hmm. to find um, about the nervous system and how to balance yourself a little bit. And I think that would help people immensely to do it. And whether they're mm-hmm. dealing with gender stuff or not, like I think so much yeah. of the world is people responding out of their nervous system being being out of whack and if they Mm -hmm. if they could get it be in a place where they're actually calm it's also easier to learn in that position that makes makes such a lot of sense though because in in a way society keeps us very busy with like Mm. oh bad news go buy stuff that will make you feel better you know it's it's very much a cycle of like yeah um Mm -hmm. consumerism and all that stuff and yeah Yeah, in that in that space in between mm -hmm. like the whatever's happening and the reaction or the response even Mm -hmm. yeah like the nervous regulation nervous system regulation is such a big thing and that Mm -hmm. I think when that's when you also start because that's something I've been working with as well for myself Mm -hmm. and I feel like in that space you get like a sense of like like I said your own needs and like setting Mm -hmm. boundaries and like okay am I exposing myself to all this negativity what effect does it have on me self-care mm-hmm. you know that's yeah. what real self-care is about in my book you know and be mm-hmm. like you know what, actually I don't have to respond to this I don't have to try and you know fix or or negotiate or clarify or you know a, all the transphobic stuff because you know you just you'll just do yourself in won't you basically yeah <laughs> yeah and and it affects you so much like I like I said I chose an all women's school because I was afraid of the of the rape uh, statistics. And I mm-hmm. was, I was so, my nervous system was so out of balance. I was so hyper vigilant, mm. and it was really hard. There's a, an amazing author, Clementine Morgan actually really speaks to my feelings about that hyper vigilance that survivors have. And this is actually something that I think is really affecting the quote unquote turf community, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. you get a hyper vigilant response of trying to prevent yourself from danger and mm-hmm. it's hard for you to actually relate to men because you're seeing danger at every corner. Yeah. All they represent to you is danger. Yeah. And that makes it hard to connect with people. It makes it hard to trust people. Mm-hmm. And it really affects your mental health in a negative way. And I feel like that can happen with almost any community and any issue. You consume this constant information that tells you these people are oppressing you. These people hate you. These people hate you. And I mm. felt the same way in, in growing up with dealing with all that stuff with the, the marriage equality fight. You know, mm. most people on a day-to-day basis may not have had any real hate for me. They may have said ignorant things. They may not have understood. Mm-hmm. But most people weren't like bi- like violent bigots. Mm. But yet, because I was constantly mm-hmm. surrounded by that and constantly consuming information that confirmed that, you know, mm. I love true crime. And I think that the, that you could write a, an amazing thesis paper on the consumption of true crime and women and, and, um, and how that affects psychology. And, and you could mm. go into a conspiracy theory of like, is true crime a psyop to keep women at home because it makes them scared to go outside. Mm. You consume this information, you constantly believe you're under under duress and under attack. And I'm not saying some people aren't, because obviously mm-hmm. people have different lives. And and as I said, gender nonconforming people are definitely not treated well on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. But we have the power to not choose that. And also we have the power to when we observe this, 
to not take this as this is the whole world hating me, which mm. completely destroys our mental health. Mm. So, you know, I'm not saying that you can, it's your fault that the media in the UK is transphobic. It's not your fault. There's lots of reasons for it, mm. but you don't have to read the articles. You don't have to engage. And understandably, yes, growing up, ignoring bullies is not the solution. And it wasn't helpful for lots of people growing up mm. to be told, just ignore it, just ignore it. Yeah. But we, but I, I'm, in, <laughs> my job is digital. Like I, I look yeah. at digital analytics for a living and I can tell you as much as people are afraid of being monitored online, people, a view is a view. A user is a user. When mm. you click on a website and you view that website and you stay on the page, you scroll down, that is engagement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're doing that because you're pissed off. It doesn't matter if you're doing that because you hate what's being written. That doesn't mm. matter. Mm. As, a, as a company, as a, as a newspaper that profits mostly from ad sales, you clicking on the, the clicking on the link, visiting the site, staying on the site means that I can I can put it in a little book to to sell to people that this is the average amount of time people spend on our site this is how far the scroll depth is it doesn't matter if you're doing it because you're pissed off mm. it doesn't matter it still benefits them mm. and it still counts as engagement on their side and mm. a lot of like facebook advertisers for example will tell you they don't use like there's lots of different objectives you can choose when you do a facebook ad mm. and you shouldn't pick engagement because actually Facebook can't can't delineate whether somebody's engaging with your post because they like you or because they hate you. Mm. So you can literally end up being paid to be hated. So understand wow. that all of these things that are coming at you digitally, engagement is engagement. Mm. So ignoring actually does give you more power when it comes to digital things. Understand that if if you engage in any way with it, that is giving like there's a there's a study somewhere please look it up and if i'm wrong please please tell me that i'm wrong mm -hmm. that even though donald trump is banned from twitter he still has the same power he still has the same mm. spread people still talk about him half of the people who talk about him supposedly hate him so when we spread yeah. this we spread this to each other we we screenshot these terrible takes we share it online with each other that brings all of our like some people all due respect, some people put online and they think they're just shouting into the ether. You're mm. not shouting into the ether. You, things that maybe you should write in a journal, you're putting online, you're, you're putting that out there. Mm. And, and I understand the venting. I understand getting your feelings out. I understand the frustration. But there's been so many trans people I've had to mute or unfollow because I don't want to read transphobic things. I don't want to read transphobic yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you don't have yeah. to share them. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Aren't it's just giving energy them? to all the negativity. And although yeah. there's such a fine line between, look, balance, this is yeah. happening and we need to do something about this and unite yeah. and really yeah. address this. That's one thing. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. But yeah. then all the, like you say, all the negativity and like, reinf I don't know, it's just reinforcing things and and giving that's feeding that I feel like when it yeah. gets to a stage where you're feeding that or when someone is feeding that then you know there are people that I've unfollowed as well like for, yeah. for similar and reasons I, yeah I under like I'm not I understand feeling like you need to talk about it I understand totally. wanting people to know that there are people who say yeah. these horrible things and we should fight them yeah I think that you just have to th be a little bit cognizant of of you know is is me sharing this and there have been lots of tweets I've I've been like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to engage because what is the point of this mm. is, is what you're doing actually helping the situation or, or is it, mm -hmm. is it hurting you? Because yeah. if your nervous system is out of, out of sync and not, mm. and it's actually, like I said, feeling angry is a lot more comforting and a lot more powerful than feeling mm. sad. So sometimes, yeah. and I know that I've done this and I, like I said, this is like exactly what I used to do. I would be angry all the time because it was, it, it felt much better. It felt totally. more empowering to be angry. Yeah. I could be angry and I felt powerful, yeah. but I felt like shit as mm. a whole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying never talk about any of this stuff. I'm not, you know, please don't take my words to any extreme, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. learning how to balance your nervous system you can then step away from some of this stuff. And that's not 
selfish or bad in any way. Mm-hmm. You have to secure your own mask before you put on anybody else's. You really yeah. have to take care of yourself. And honestly, if, as I said, I think that a lot of, of people who are quote unquote TERFs, I think that it's a trauma response, like to mm. be honest with you. And I think that if they were taking care of themselves, some of those people, they wouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. So it has to start from you and you have to take care of yourself and you have to mm-hmm. learn how to balance yourself easy. You're, it's not to say you'll never feel scared or, or upset, mm-hmm. but you'll you'll fully be able to to trust yourself and be able to step into a better place in your life from so many different aspects, if you can learn how to balance your nervous system a little bit better. And that I think could be helpful for so many different things. Um, And don't feel bad. Like, please, there's so, I feel like so many people are putting stuff out and posting things because they feel like they have to, because they feel like they have to show that they care. Any Mm -hmm. person who actually gives a shit about you and knows you, you need to be among people who know you and respect you and don't take every single little action you do as a full sign of your humanity or every single thing you don't do as a full sign of your humanity. There are communities that some people are in where it's like, if you don't say a certain thing or if you don't do a certain thing or if you do do a certain thing, it doesn't matter how long you've been in that community, you will be out. Mm. And that is not great for you. Mm. So if, mm. if you genuinely feel like you really shouldn't feel like you have to do something in order to prove your goodness. And if Mm -hmm. you do, then you, if you ever had a little bit of a more balanced nervous system, you would be able to step away from that and Mm -hmm. separate yourself from that because please don't feel bad taking care of yourself. Like you have to do that first. And I think there's, you know, a lot of people don't grow up knowing how to take care of themselves. It's not their fault. Like they self-soothing yeah. and things. I'm, I feel like I've had to learn that. And I thought that comes yeah. with, for me, like the discovering like what my needs actually are because I've denied mm-hmm. them for so long. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like how do I soothe myself when I get activated, like when my nervous mm-hmm. system gets activated or when I get mm-hmm. like an anxious, like a reaction, when I'm re- in real reaction mode, like how do mm-hmm. I soothe myself? That is such a good skill to learn, you know? Yeah. yeah. And if you're in a community that doesn't allow you to do that, um, mm. that, that literally, because that's like, I feel like that's really common, um, mm. where you soothing yourself, you're not allowed to take a step back mm. and, and be like, actually, I can't really deal with this now. I need to take a yeah. step back. Mm. If you can't do that, <laughs> mm. then you got to oh, get those. out of that community because it's, it's not a good place. Mm. Yeah, totally. Wow. Well, I hope that we will have a more empowered world. I think we can empower ourselves and others, I think, by, yeah, by all this. I think there's so much in that, like, you know, Mm -hmm. regulating ourselves and taking care of ourselves, like real self-care and what that means. Like Mm -hmm. massages are nice and things. I love them. Yeah. But that's not all there is to it. (laughs) And and companies, you know, really want you to think self-care is is buying stuff. And it's not to say, you know, buying stuff is bad in every case, but like Mm. really pay attention to to the things that get picked up mm-hmm. by, 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 as a catchphrase by big companies mm. and really be skeptical of that. Mm. Um, it's not to say that the original intent behind any of these things are bad, but like, I, you know, I really hope I don't live to see the day where like, you know, the, the stuff that's going on with the Amazon unions is so awesome and, mm. and so incredible. And I, I really, <laughs> I'm going to see the day and I work in marketing. Like I feel like I know where uh, they will be glad to put trans women or women on, on an ad while, while not giving their workers any time off or not, you know, cutting their pay or or whatever, like Mm. be very, very wary of the way that, Mm. that people will just take this up. And, And when you're a little bit more balanced in yourself, then, you know, it's, it's easy when you're not balanced to, be anxious about other people's inability to, to take this stuff on. Like you got to you know, you have to repeat this. And mm. I used to outsource my personal feeling of safety to other people. And I needed other people to prove that they were safe to wow. me by mm. repeating things or gendering me correctly. You have mm. to prove that you are, that I'm safe around you and I don't feel safe around you mm. instead of learning how to be safe within myself and mm. to trust myself um yeah. companies will make you feel safe um while not not you know and i'm not saying all companies are bad like 
you know, mm. they're run by people and people are people, That's but right. just, just be a little bit, you know, don't, when you become a little bit more balanced, it's easy to be a little bit more skeptical about things. It's easier to tolerate people who maybe don't say the right things. You know, mm. people like my great aunt, um, mm. who maybe say things, the in, well intended thing, things in, in the quote unquote wrong way. Yeah. And, and ignorant. that's actually, yeah, yeah that's actually, mm. that's actually better mm-hmm. in some ways than someone who says all the right things. I mean, I have people who talk really horribly about me, but call me they. So yeah, that's you know. not all there is to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, that was such an insightful conversation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> so nice. much for sharing, Lola. Thank you. Thanks and for I look having me. And I forward to reading your book. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And if anyone wants to get it, it's through Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Mm-hmm. I think it's also available on Amazon, but it's okay if you don't want to buy it there. You can, <laughs> yeah, I would, you can I would buy it try directly and avoid from it if I can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and if you want it in a bookstore, then ask them to stock it. So, and, and they should be able mm. to get it from Jessica Kingsley Publishers. So, yeah. Thank nice you very one. much. You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Lola, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find Lola on their website, nonmonogamyhelp.com, and on Twitter and Instagram at nonmonogamyhelp. More links are on the episode page. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media, and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open minded. I can I can relate to the bullying part for different reasons, but you know, it's a thing. Why is this alarm going off now? That's okay. Oh, I think it's when I thought you were meeting me at half past the hour. <laughs> So I'm going, okay. turn the, I'm going to turn the other alarm off as well now. <laughs> okay. The other thing that I think that I would add about being non-binary is that I think... Oh, seriously. No, Don't worry. I just turned this off. Anyway, please continue. <laughs>